we're done. Let's give it a try. Is this thing on? <laughs> I won't use that. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the show. Fernando? Welcome to the show. Perfect. Today we have what I like to call, well, I don't have a name for it, but it's cool because it's what we used to do a lot of. And it's nice to just get back to doing something simple like this. We've been doing a lot of more complex things, DSPs and all that fun stuff. This one is, this, this one is, it's almost like super simple, right? Uh, okay, yeah. Let's go with that. This is what we used to do a lot of before the DSP became all the rage and everyone wanted DSPs and processors <clears> and <throat> right. three-way and active and ah, What is it that we're doing? Let's get to that. So what we have up front is gonna be a nice Sony in-dash CD player with Bluetooth. No screen, no, just nice CD player. We're gonna do a four channel amp, and that's gonna power the speakers. Oh my gosh, I know, right? Then we're gonna do four, either six and a halfs or five by sevens, we don't know yet. Yep. It's a Ford Fusion, so we'll get these off. He went out and bought these. The car didn't come with the factory sail fin tweeters, so he found them online and picked up a set so that we can go ahead and add in a set of tweeters. I strongly recommend doing this if your car doesn't have tweeters and your car is capable of having them, you just need to buy a plastic panel to do it. It even came with the factory tweeters. How cool is that? That's all we're doing. I know. That's it? That's it. All done. All, all right. done. On to the next yeah. guy. <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and get started with this. Talk about the parts we're gonna need. Talk about getting the door panels on. You know what we're gonna do. So let's get to us. Ready, Fernando? Ready. Let's go. No matter what system we're putting in a car, there's a certain amount of time that we spend on the car figuring out where everything needs to go. That's one of the things we're gonna concentrate in this video is kind of just going through the motions of what we have to do, where things have to go. Even though it's not the most complex of installs, there's still a lot of thought that goes into it. So for example, gone ahead and popped the hood and we wanna figure out what side of the car the battery's on. Believe it or not, that's important for one, power wire routing. If it's on the passenger side and we are going to mount the amp so we're coming up the passenger side, the first thing we need to do is figure out can we get through the firewall on the passenger side? Sometimes because of the air conditioner it's nearly impossible and it's not worth it. In which case we'll go to the driver's side. Now there again if the battery's on the driver's side usually it's easier to get through the firewall on the driver's side. Usually. There's an exception for everything. So in this case the battery is on the driver's side. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and try to figure out how to get through the firewall first. And that's before we even start on all the other stuff. We have to get an idea of where it goes. Secondly, we have to figure out where we're gonna put this amplifier. Is it gonna fit underneath the seat? If not, will it fit underneath the passenger seat? If it's not gonna fit there, where back here is it gonna go? Is it gonna mount here to this convenient flat side panel? Is there room underneath the tire here? So we spend a certain amount of time at the beginning of every install figuring that out. Let's figure it out. So Fernando's done some investigation on whether or not we can fit it underneath the seats. And both seats basically look the same. He's got this really deep floor mat. There's all this wiring here up underneath the seat. So the amplifier, it's just not gonna fit here comfortably. So into the trunk, it's gonna go. So what we're gonna end up doing is building a panel and mounting the amplifier here on this flat surface out of the way. So that's the plan for that. Next, we, what we wanna do is go ahead and get this driver's front door off here and figure out if it's a six and a half or five by seven. The customer feels that it's a six and a half. Paul feels it's a five by seven. I personally don't care. I'm gonna put the size in that, that fits and we're gonna move on from there. So enjoy Fernando as he shows you how to take this door panel off. So like we always say, just go around the door panel just to find where the screws are. And this one, and the lock, and the handle, it's it's a cap. Be careful, pop it out. Has a Torx, and the door where the switches are, it's a rubber mat, take it out. It looks like a seven millimeter. T20, we got one on the bottom and one on the side. Now you can grab your panel tool. And the door panel is out. 
So now that the door panel's off, we can clearly see that Paul was right in this bed and that it is a five by seven. So for this install, because it is a five by seven, we will not be going with the CS six and a half. Instead, we'll be going with the CSC 68s, which will fit because it is a five by seven slash six by eight. So let's go ahead and open these things up and take a look at them because this is the latest version of Kicker's speaker. They've redesigned them. Naturally, every year when a speaker manufacturer comes out with a new design, it's always to just push that speaker capabilities a little bit further than they have in the past. Manufacturing costs change, products that are used in the manufacturing of the speakers change, things get cheaper, some things get more expensive. So they're always readdressing to try to improve the sound of speakers. Everyone does it. And in this case, for Kicker, they went ahead and changed the tweeter in these and updated them. You can tell the difference between the two is the old tweeter was silver and this new one is this gold color to match the whole color scheme of the CS line. Now, one of the things, Kicker really takes depth as an issue. They wanna make sure that their speakers will fit in all applications, meaning they don't want to come out with something that has this huge basket because that limits the amount of vehicles it can go in. They always come out with a basket that is a little bit shallower and more narrow, and they're real conscious about how these things go in so that this will go into every Ford or 5x7 application. But that follows true for the whole line. So whether it's a six and a half, a five and a quarter, a six by nine. So if you're worried about a speaker fitting, these are good for that. As far as the makeup of the speaker, it has a foam style surround. It has a plastic mica style cone, metal tweeter, decent sized magnet. It is a four ohm speaker. It has a texture coated basket. Let's go ahead and hand this over to Fernando so we can get it in the car. Make sure you foam the basket so it doesn't rattle. It, because we're gonna run a tweeter, we're gonna install a pigtail from the mid range all the way to the top. So one of the things that we're doing in this is taking out this sail fin, the factory one here, and we're gonna replace it with those cool ones that we showed you. So let's head over to the bench and take a look at how we plan on doing that. So they call this a sail panel because it, well, looks like a sail. This is the replacement for it from the factory, very similar. The reason why you just don't cut into these, which you can, that's entirely up to you, is if you'll notice, it's not entirely flat. So what you end up with is you drill a hole here, but then on the sides here, if you're one of those really picky people, you'll see where the tweet doesn't fall in so you have a little tiny gap here that you don't have on the back side for some people that's a big deal so they buy these now the factory just uses two screws here and here to hold the tweeter in and then what we have behind it is a fairly decent sized hole for an aftermarket tweeter to go in now what we're gonna have to do is fabricate some kind of a bracket if we can't remove the tweeter off of the factory bracket but we'll take a look at that in a minute let's go ahead and open up the tweeters that we're putting in and take a look at those so for this we will We'll be using the CST20s. Now naturally they come with an instruction sheet that gives you the power rating on them. This is a three quarter inch titanium tweeter with a four ohm impedance and 100 watts of power handling at max. Normal power handling is 50 watts and it's got a 92 dB of efficiency. Frequency response is between 4,500 to 21,000 Hertz. Oh, they give you a cute little how to run wire through the boot. Now one thing I like about the Kicker tweeters is they really think about mounting and they give you a ton of different different options as far as mounting goes. So let's open this thing up and I'll show you what I'm talking about. See, there's lots of parts for mounting the tweeter. So you have that angle. So in this case, if you were to cut into the factory, as you can see here, see how you can see my finger, that gap? It's gonna be there because this is not flat. So that's why he said, I don't wanna cut into this, I'll just buy the right thing. But they have two little angle mounts so you can angle the tweeter if you are mounting it on a flat surface. Then they have one that is a little bit steeper. So you can actually combine these two because there's four of them. You can twist them or stack them or turn them upside down and you can get all different mounting angles for it if you're externally mounting them and you really want to dial in that angle mount for the tweeter. Then you have the screw in for it which is fairly long so it's designed to go all the way through it and that will screw on to the back of the tweeter itself. So it actually comes with two different screw-ons 
the short half inch version and the longer one inch version. And then there's also a flush panel that goes around the edge of the tweeter and then a scan mount angle adapter too. There's a ton of different pieces, but what makes it mm, just icing on the cake, this guy right here, there's actually a threaded insert in the back so that you can screw in your bracket. A lot of brackets, the tweeter just screws into them. It just makes installation that much easier when you're doing this. So for example, we could easily just make a bridge that goes across this and then screw the tweeter into the center of it here and we'd be done, which is probably what we're gonna end up doing. This is the crossover for the tweeter. All right, so let's just get all this stuff out of the way and we'll figure out how we're gonna mount this. Now looking closely at the tweeter itself, the whole opening, like this looks like it will come off of here if I go ahead and remove this epoxy that they have on it, but the whole opening itself doesn't look like it's going to fit this tweeter. So I would have to thin out the wall, which honestly is probably not worth the amount of time it's gonna take to do that, where I could easily just make a bracket that goes across these two points here and mount the tweeter right where I want it in the center there. And what we'll use to do that is a piece of 16th inch. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut a three quarter inch piece of 16th inch ABS and we'll go ahead and get this tweeter mounted in. So I went over to the table saw and I cut up a little three quarter inch piece of eighth inch ABS. Now ABS is extremely rigid. You could also use Centra for this, which is the blown PVC. Now what we wanna do is go ahead and heat this up. And for that, we are gonna put on some gloves because this is gonna get hot. And the reason why we have to heat it up is because there needs to be a little S-bend here at the front because it sits lower than the back. Now you can get this stuff pretty flexible. Now all we wanna do is come back in here, thread it through the tweeter, tweeter where we want it. Now the hotter you get this stuff, the more time you'll have to play with it. And then use all your fingers to kind of mash it into the shape that you want it to copy. So make sure your tweeter is sitting where it's gonna be sitting, and then just kind of rub the plastic, getting it to bend. And you're gonna have to hold it there for a couple minutes. That's why we put the gloves on, because it burns your fingers otherwise. Now now it's gonna get close. You can see this kind of gives us the shape we're looking for. It's, it's not perfect, it's not a straight 90, but we're in the, the ballpark of where we wanna be. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna heat this up a little bit more and we're gonna just tweak this form. You don't wanna get it as hot as you had it the first time because really all you need to do is get in there and manipulate it a little bit. Now the one thing we wanna do is on this side right here, it has a slight curve to it that we need to subtract from our mount. And also, it is a little thinner. There are these little nubs right here. So we'll go ahead and remove those because they're in the way. And now we have our mount. So now all we have to do is go ahead and drill our holes, which we can line it up with our factory tweeter to do that, as well as drill our hole for this. And we can go ahead and screw it in place. To do as much manipulation as you need on the bracket, we went ahead and eyed this out a little bit more, made it wider so that we'd have a little left and right shift so that we could get that tweeter perfectly over the center. There we go. We've got it mounted in there nice. I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Fernando. He'll go ahead and finish dressing up the wire and get it into the car. And we'll move on to the second one. Cause the joy of doing stuff like this is there's always two. So through the magic of video editing, you guys just saw me hand Fernando the tweeter and he's already got it in the car. I know, right? Let's take a look and see what it looks like. Now we've gone ahead and we've changed the way we do tweeters a little bit. Like naturally, you always evolve and come up with better ways of doing things. In the past, we would use bullet connectors, which we're very fond of. We, we like them a lot. It allows us to make a removable, easy to install product. So first thing, we went ahead and got it a five by seven mounted in the door like you saw. We were able to use the fabric factory screws. Using the factory screws can be sketchy on some installations because of the way that this portion of the speaker is made. Sometimes factory screws have really big heads and it's not a good idea to use them because it will either break this, cut into it, it won't sit flush, the holes don't line up. So don't feel like you have to use these. So we've gone ahead and zip tied in the crossover. It is hiding right here where it will stay nice and dry. We've taped up over both ends also to keep any dirt and debris 
debris out of it. Although this door panel is pretty sealed and clean, I don't think it would have been an issue. Better to be safe than sorry. And then up here at the top, we have this, which is our new tweeter clip. So it is a male and female end that we can simply plug in our tweeter to. And that makes servicing it fairly simple. So we've gone ahead and soldered it into our tweeter. Now all we need to do is snap the tweeter up in place. And if for some reason they ever need to pull it off to get to that clip behind there to replace the mirror or whatever, there's a clip that allows the dealer to easily do it. This door is done, let's move to the next one. So the rear door is gonna be the same. We're gonna find the screws first. So like you guys saw, I already put my foam in the back of the basket, screwed the, the speaker back together, and we done. So welcome to the inside of the vehicle. We are going to go ahead and get this radio out so we can see which harness it's using. Even though we go to pack-audio.com to figure out what harness we need, we just like to validate it before we go ahead and start wiring it up on the bench. I can't tell you how many times Paul has handed me a harness. I've wired it up on the bench and come pull the radio out afterwards and it's totally the wrong harness and he'll be like, well, they listed two and I just gave you the first one. Do yourself a favor and always Pull the dash and see the back of the radio. We get asked a ton of times, what harness does my car need? What does this look like? Plenty and I'm putting the install in. Pull the radio out, take a picture of it, go onto the internet, go to the places like pack-audio.com. You can compare it to the picture they give you. They put that picture up there so that you can compare the two. Now to get this off, we just simply have to pop this front panel off. For that, we just need a panel tool. This is our new wedge that we're using. You can find all the tools that we use for our installs on DNF tool drawer. There's links to them all there. There's one plug that is removed. Now it is the airbag plug. Some vehicles, when you remove this, what you want to do is go ahead and pull this back out of whatever it's mounted into and plug it back in. It's not a bad practice to do because you don't know which cars need the airbags plugged in and which cars don't. So if you want to be safe, go ahead and plug it back in and you won't have to worry about it. I can tell you on a Ford, if we unplug this, turn the key on, it's gonna show an airbag warning. If we plug this back in, turn the key on, it's gonna erase that airbag warning. So it does have the ability to reset itself. But if you're worried, and rightly so, because nothing sucks more than at the end of the day, an airbag light on, just go ahead and plug it back in. Now to get this radio out, we have four seven millimeter screws. And then the unit will pull out. Now there is two harnesses on this. This harness here is typically the auxiliary Sirius XM or the data connection. If this was a data car, it would all be in this smaller harness here. If there was a smaller harness that is half the size of this one, that would be your subwoofer harness. But in this case, this is the only one that we're worried about. And this harness is gonna be your speakers, your power, your accessory, your illumination, as well as if it had steering wheel controls, they would also be in this harness. Now for this, we're gonna use a BHA 5800. Always go ahead and grab the harness and check that the accessory wire is in the pin. Ford used this same harness for a very long time. They have versions of it that need data and some of them that don't need data. How you check that is to make sure there is a wire on the opposite side of the red wire. If there isn't one, you have a data card. So we can go ahead and plug that in here and we can see in this top right hand corner next to the power, there needs to be a wire. And in this case, there's a green wire right there. We can also keep checking 
Here is the power antenna wire, which is three over from the left. It does have a power antenna <coughs> wire here. And then there is no outboard amplifier, so there is no wire attached on the opposite side of this blue white. A helpful hint, if this car had steering wheel controls, the steering wheel control wires also in here next to these blue, orange, and red wires. It's not pinned in this harness. We can pull these out and pin them back into where the steering wheel control goes. In order to repin it, as you'll notice, there's this red red inside here. This comes out, you can move the pin, move it where it needs to go, put the red piece back in and you're all set. But now that we know we need this harness, we know which wires we have to hook on, join me on the bench as we start to wire up the radio. The customer went ahead and supplied us with this Sony radio. Go ahead and see what it has. First off, the model number is WX-920BT. Obviously, you're gonna get some form of an owner's manual warranty card. It comes with a remote, the radio itself, the power plug, and a Bluetooth microphone. Now, anytime I unbox a radio, I wanna grab the screws that I need to mount it, and then I go ahead and put the remote control and the owner's manual back in the box. Mainly that remote control, because those things are easily lost in the install bay, or the garage, or wherever it is you're doing your stereo. If you put it in the box until you're done, you know where it's at. So Sony uses the upside down L chassis. And what I mean by that is obviously this would be the right way L chassis and this is the upside down L chassis. It's a single din back, but with a double din front. This is helpful depending on some of the installs you might be doing. For one, it's gonna give you plenty of room here for any excess wire. When you're doing a smart harness, there's that brain box and it's easy to mount those under here. If the dash is just tight, that frees up a lot of space. So this is a really nice way to do it. Sony is making this so that for us, the installers, they're not just wasting room in the dash because as we all know, room in the dash is tight and that whole big open chassis that's not doing anything is a waste of space. Let us have that back. Like most Sony's, it's got a knob. That is one of the things that Sony has carried through their radios. It's a CD player. Now this harness is just a straightforward harness as far as that goes. It's gonna have our eight colored speaker wires here, which is gonna match up to this if we were just doing a radio radio install, but we're not. We're adding an amplifier, so we're not gonna be using these. For those of you that are going, what are the colors? We have white is driver's front, gray is passenger front, green is driver's rear, and purple is passenger rear. There's a solid and a stripe. The stripe is negative. We have the blue white, which is our amplifier turn on, which we will be using. We have an illumination wire, which is orange white. Then we have the red accessory, the yellow memory, and the black ground. Now, they give you a long ground wire like most manufacturers do, just just in case you actually need to take this to a chassis ground. I will tell you that this is helpful, especially in Toyotas and Nissans. For us, what we're gonna go ahead and do is connect the portion that we're gonna be using to power up the radio. Because this has an amplified antenna adapter, we are going to connect that to our accessory power and not our remote turn on. The reason why we're not gonna do that is a lot of times this draws way more current than the remote turn on is designed to handle. And especially since we're gonna be turning on an amplifier, we don't need that extra excess draw. Now it's not a powered antenna that is actually going up and down. Those will typically have a relay on them so they're not drawing a ton of power. We'll also go ahead and cap off all these speaker wires that we're not going to be using because we don't want the amplifier in the radio to short out. Now when we wire up our harnesses, what we like to do is kind of segregate out what is going where. So this is going to be for the feed from the amplifier to power up the speakers. So what we do is we take a remote turn on and loop it through our harness. You can see it right here where it's looping through. And what that does is that allows us to connect our speed wire that we're gonna be using right to here and not have to branch off the remote turn on somewhere else. Just makes the installation just a little nicer. Now the harness is done. What you wanna do is anytime you do the shrink wrap before you tape up over it, if you're going to be taping up over it, make sure this is cool to the touch before you do it because shrink wrap will stay pretty soft until then. And if you tape up over it and make the tape real tight, you run the risk of having wires poke through causing a short. So just let this thing cool off and then you can tape it up. Let's go ahead and take a look at the dash kit. 
So along with the radio, the customer went ahead and brought us the Dash Kit 2. He's using a Metra 95 This is one of the Metra kits I really like. And if you're using a Sony head unit that has that volume knob on it, this is the kit you want. The best kits countersinks in the radio and it looks really good because it countersinks in the radio, adds a nice bezel. The problem is when you have that volume knob right here, it's too far in and it's you almost can't get your hands on it. But with this kit, it's flat across the front so it keeps that volume knob out easy to get to. Now even though this radio has a volume knob, it's sticking out really far. That's not gonna be an issue. And in this case, the other kit might have been a better option because of how far this is going to stick out. Even though he brought us this kit, is just go ahead and we'll take this kit back and go ahead and grab the right kit for this particular radio. Because we stock both kits for different situations, so it's not like it's that big of a deal for us. I would much rather have it look really nice in the dash than just because he brought us the kit. So this is the BK FMK 542. And as you can see, it's got this bevel to it here. So now when we put it on this kit, as you can see, it looks a lot better. It sinks it in there and it doesn't stick out as far as it did before. So for this particular Sony, this is gonna be a much nicer look in the dash. So let's get this guy put on. With most kits, they come with tons of little brackets here that you need to break off depending on what the factory radio looks like. In the Fords, the easiest thing to do is to just grab the factory radio and figure out what brackets you need. There's two brackets here right next to one another and those have to do with the depth. The easiest thing to do for that is to just go ahead and measure with a tape measure and or test fit it in the car putting that front bezel back on to see which one you need. Now since we're not doing a single din, we're doing a double din, this piece right here is going to break off because this is for the pocket. Now the best tool for cutting all these things off along with a set of nice flush cutters is a sand disc that'll allow you to get in here and keep this stuff nice and smooth because you want this smooth up against the frame of the radio another nice tool to have for this is a set of duckbills pliers duckbill means it's a flat head like this it's not a needle nose you can go ahead and grab on get nice and flush and just twist and it'll pull it off and keep it flush it cuts down the amount of sanding you have to do the problem with the duck bills is when you get to a portion like this that jets out, it will typically break the kit and you don't want that. So in that case, it's just easier to sand it off and go ahead and cut it flush. And now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and put this in here and we can measure from the front side of this to the back side of that. And that puts us at seven eighths. That's gonna put us at the back bracket here. So we'll go ahead and remove this front bracket and then we'll repeat the process on the other side. Now we can go ahead and slide the radio in, get it lined up. Now the only mounting we're gonna get is on this top here. So make sure you go ahead and use both screws front and back. Don't do just the one screw option like, like some people do. I'll see, we'll get the radio in it, I'll be loose and there's like one screw here, one screw on the, yeah, no. Now another nice thing about the best kit is that it comes with a bag of screws. So we can get a screw here. And then check your gapping. Make sure that the radio is straight. Make sure that the gap is level all the way across. Check to make sure if you can see daylight between the kit. That's important. We have this really bright light over here out of frame so that we could film, but it also makes it really nice because it shows the gapping and the lines really well. So this is mounted in there. So naturally the first thing we wanna do is open the amplifier so we can size the thing into the car. This is the GMD8704, it's a four channel amplifier. You get the owner's manual. You get a bag of goodies here. In the bag, this amplifier will do high level or low level input and it does it through the RCA inputs. So they give you this cool pigtail here that is speaker wire to RCAs. This is an updated version of this. It used to come with just these end strip. Now they're adding in these little wires right here. I like this a lot better. This is nice. It has a subwoofer volume control so that if you wanted to do a mixed application, meaning use one and two for fronts and three and four bridge to a subwoofer, it comes with a subwoofer 
example for level control, and that's this guy right here. Now this particular amplifier has two 30 amp fuses, and it has the one thing that I, I criticize the most about these amplifiers that Pioneer makes. They've been doing this for a while now, and honestly, it drives me crazy. Rockford does it too on their prime amplifiers. I hate this design right here. The reason is, is the wires come out in an angle like this. They should come straight out, because in a situation like this, where this needs to be up against the floor and not have risers on it, the wire's gonna come out and bend. I don't like that. There's no reason to have this type of end. It's a pet peeve of mine. This end of the amplifier here, if the bass boost plugs in, the high pass for channel A, which is variable between 40 and 500 hertz, it's got a heck of a swing. Low pass, off, and high pass selector switch. Your input sensitivity, 6.5 volts to 0.2 volts. Input selector, two channel or four channel. So if you only have one RCA that you're running into this, just select it, makes it kind of nice. You have an output here so that you can go out of this to a second amplifier if need be. Input A. Input B, then matching settings for channel B over here. You have a power protect light here. Now looking back on the other side, negative, remote, positive. Channel B is first. Positive, negative, negative, positive on the terminals. Now one thing they did different on this is they actually made these so you can see them. If you've ever used an older Pioneer, they're very hard to see. These clear as can be. On the bottom here, it shows you how to bridge them. Left positive, right negative. Channel A is going to match the same. Let's go ahead and get this into the car and figure out where we're gonna put it. Knowing that we're gonna be mounting the amplifier into the side of the car here, what we wanna do is go ahead and remove the back seat. That's just gonna make our lives a little bit easier and it's only a couple bolts to do it. Looks like we have a 10 here, maybe a 14 here. We have a Torx that's holding the seat belt. Let's get them out. So for this, there's a little lever right here. So you have to kind of push on it this way and then that'll loosen up the clip and you can reach in behind and push it over. Whatever. So that frees up this area here. We have a nice big area on this side that we can run our wiring through following their factory wiring. It doesn't have to loop around the front here. This panel behind here is basically flat. There's a piece of half inch foam on here that sits up against it for road noise so we can leave that. More than likely what we'll end up doing is what we call a sandwich mount where we're gonna put a piece of product behind here and then a piece on the front and the two will sandwich between this material here and it'll hold this amplifier in place. In certain situations, we would drill through and put rivets to hold it in place. Because this is the wheel well on the other side, we really don't wanna drill through into the wheel well. You would see them and or water could get in. And this will hold it nice and firm in place. We'll have the wiring come up and into the top here so it'll come through that hole. And also because we are gonna mount it in the trunk, I can go ahead and put it on risers so that I can get a good bend on that wire and not have to go Go for maximum bend and there's almost enough room here so that if he ever decides to go with a sub amp we can actually stack two on top of one another so what i might do is just go ahead and make the panel taller than it needs to be so that if he ever comes back to have a sub amp in the panel's already there and ready to go all we'll have to do is add in the wiring all right so we have a plan let's go ahead and get started i'll meet you on the bench we're back at the bench now, and some time has elapsed since the last clip of the video and this one. We were gonna mount the amp in that side panel there, and it was like, yay, cool, and we we're gonna make it big enough to fit two, and we cut it, and it is a 17 by 13 panel, which is enough to fit two of these Pioneers. And then we just kinda got sidetracked doing something else, and so here we are now, a little further along than we'd normally like to be in one of these videos. But what have we done so far? The first thing is, since we're only doing a four channel amp, we ran a four channel RCA. So we have a 17 foot, 4000 series Stinger RCA. And the nice thing about the four channels, it says R, it says F, but we still go ahead and we put on our colored ends here that make it go in. And these are the same colors as the speaker wires we talked about. Why we like these is because they're flat, so these will flat in the car and we put risers on the amplifier like we talked about so we were able to zip tie the RCA down underneath the amplifier thus allowing us to push this amplifier all the way to the edge here so that is done and then what we were looking at is how are we gonna get these speaker wires and RCAs and power wire through here and I was like you know these bridges that we've been using is a really good idea so we went ahead and added more half inch here this groundwork and really the problem in that bend is here on 
the power side. So I wanted to make sure we could go the full length down to this to bend that power wire. It's gonna go into this channel right here and come out. And then there's this area right here. So if we were to take this amp and move it here as a mono block, this is where the power wire would be going into that next one. So this is going to zip tie across like this along with the RCAs. And this area here would be where the mono block is gonna go and the stuff won't get in the way. And then our RCA is gonna run up here next to it and go like this. So that's what we're doing right now. We've also braided up the ends of the speaker wires and the speed wire so that this will match up into these outputs because remember rear is first, front is second. So when you're adding in this piece of shrink wrap and you're braiding these wires, you wanna braid them so that they are laying properly. On the top, we wanna make sure the front is on the top here like this so that they'll go into this side first and the rear is the same way so it'll go here and then the remote turn on will reach over here into the power section. We're using zip ties and we're gonna go ahead and we're putting the heads on the back side. This is also another thing that when we're building these amp boards we have to think about because depending on what this is gonna get screwed up against, these heads they, they add another eighth of an inch. For us there's carpet and then whatnot so these will go into the carpet no problem. I think we're caught up. Let's continue on with the amp rack. Voila. Amplifier is all set and ready to go. On the end here, we have those power wires set below the signal wires here. See how that comes down? When you space it up, it fits better, but if you don't add that spacer, then it's gonna be at a really sharp turn. I don't like that. What we're going to do is we're going to put another piece behind this so that we can screw through this and to that, sandwiching the carpet between them. So let's head to the back of the car. amplifier is mounted in place. Because of the taper, this area right here, we just made the panel that we use from here 
to here in the back and there again we made it out of half inch we also left that jute behind there that was behind there so this is bulged out an inch but because there was plenty of play in this carpeted mat it's not going to affect it at all we ran the wires up into the side here which is right on the other side of the hole where the factory wiring comes out and of course we've zip tied the wire into the factory wiring harness so we don't have to worry about it getting in the way of any clips the only thing we have to do is go ahead and ground the amplifier Fire. We were hoping that there would be a factory ground point somewhere around here. There isn't, so we'll make our own. There again, we don't want to go into this because this is the tire. So we're either going to go up into this or this side here, being careful to not poke through <laughs> to the outside of the car. Grounding, we're going to be using this guy right here. This is the ground kit we use. You can go to positiveground.com to find the product. So the first thing you do is you have the tapered drill bit here, and then that goes into this guy right here, which that hole you made lines up with the center pin here, and then gives you a nice circular pattern of paint removal. And then that goes into the nut driver that will put in the self-threading nut. You also have a lock washer that goes on to the nut itself like this to lock it all into place and then if you have room on the other side they do provide you with bolts so that you can lock it in extra tight and then they also give you some electrolytic jelly so that it doesn't corrode next up the wire brush and as you can see, you get a nice round area there where all the paint is removed. For putting the screw in, you definitely want to switch to something that has impact capabilities. So there you go, you have a nice bite on the ground. You don't have to worry about it twisting. For the most part, this area is done back here. I'm going to go ahead and clip off these zip tie ends because obviously we're not going to leave them like that. And I can put the back of this car back together. So I'll put in these side panels, bolt the seat back into place. What we made here is what we like to call our standard S-bend, meaning it's mounted down here, angles up and angles over in the shape of an S. It's made out of quarter inch ABS. Anytime you're going under the hood, you definitely want to use ABS and not the blown PVC because this can handle the heat. ABS, ABS, ABS. Short run to the battery, attached to the factory bolt here. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and unplug the airbag so it's not in our way for right now. We'll tuck the wire over here to the side. We have our RCAs all set. We can plug those into the front and rear. Now, when you're plugging in front and rear on a radio, make sure you read the back of the radio. It doesn't always go front, rear, sub. Like on a Kenwood, it actually goes rear, front, sub. Sub. We'll get our main power plugged in. We got our antenna. And of course we have the Bluetooth mic. Now I do like the way Sony makes their inputs different colors. So you have like a blue and a red and it just makes things easier. So it's just not all black holes. So we'll go ahead and plug back in the airbag and we'll turn it on. And we got static. So we get asked often why we wait till the very end to do the polarity check, like the door panel's already on and everything's pretty much already done. And that in itself is actually the answer to the question. For example, you have the speakers go in the door, connection number one. We had to add in any wiring, that would be connection number two. Then you have connection number three at the amplifier. Then you have connection number four behind the radio. And then there could be other connections depending on how you ran it, but there's four connections in this car that could be backwards. In order to test that, we need to go to the source, which is in this case the CD player, and from there out to the speaker. So we need to test all four of those connections on all six of the speakers in this car. That's why we wait till the very end. The reason why we put the door panels back on the car and we don't leave them off until we get to this point is because it's a small install bay and for us it's much safer to put the doors back on the car than to leave them off and run the risk of knocking them over or Scratch getting them down. scratched or or someone like Paul coming through the install bay not paying attention and kicking them and they get knocked over. We don't want to risk that. All the speakers polarity test the way we want them. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to hop into the trunk. Fernando's going to leave the disc in. I will grab the DD1 and we're going to do some DD1 gain structure setting. For that we're going to play the 0 dB track at 1000 Hz first and we're going to move that on to, for this we're going to put it at negative 5 dB for mids and highs on this one. Ooh, dude, it's got this cool lighting right here. 
I like that. Now, anytime you're doing any form of distortion detecting, make sure that none of the speakers are connected. Be a subwoofer, a tweeter, nothing. No crossovers. Disconnect it here at the amplifier. All right, so go ahead and start turning up the volume. This is the zero dB thousand hertz track. We're detecting it. You see the blue light come on here. And then we have a red light at zero dB. Turn the volume down. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, right there. Go up one. Down one. What number is that? 43. 43. Now we'll go ahead and we'll play the 40 hertz test tone just to see where it is for that as well. So we'll play 0 dB at 40 hertz. Even though this is a high pass amplifier, that's okay. We just want to see where it's going to clip at on both. Go to 44. 44. And 44 distorts, 43 doesn't. So we know whether it's a high or low output out of that radio at 43 is max volume so we'll go ahead and relay that information to the customer so that they know when they're adjusting it go ahead and play negative 5 db and leave it at 43 so we'll go ahead and since we're attached to the rear we'll do those first so we get a red light there it's telling us that we're clipping we'll turn it down until the red light goes off the gain structure is set now on the amplifier at this point what you want to do is go ahead and turn the radio down one other thing too is if you're like us where you have a bunch of test tones downloaded into a playlist on your phone you want to make sure that those are put into a playlist that does not auto play because you don't want to be jamming out listening and then all of a sudden a thousand hertz test track comes on it's a good way to blow some stuff so fernando went ahead and got the dash put back on that dash kit that puts it in there it's not sticking out like it would have been with the other dash kit it looks really nice there's a beveled edge here it matches the roundness so it looks nice in the dash Babe, I'm leaving. I must be on my way. So the immediate takeaway, right, right off the bat, just just putting on and listening to our first song is, as Fernando said, "Wow, yeah." There is a major difference between deck power and amplifier power major it's like i can't stress it enough adding an amplifier to your highs makes everything louder changed the whole system this customer decided to do that right from the get-go amp these things and make them sound give them the best chance they can and these aren't the crazy expensive speakers either no. these are like as far yes. as the kicker mm -hmm. these are the entry-level kickers yeah these things sound incredible now i am going to go ahead and turn the high pass filter on and set it for 40 or 50 hertz just because at the higher volumes, you can tell that they are struggling just a little bit. And I'm sure we'd much rather have that higher volume capability. But yeah, dude, uh, yeah. power is the magic word. So as far as like a nice simple install that this is, I mean, we don't have to time alignment. We don't have to do anything. Mm. It, it's, but we're leaving it on like, wow, mm -hmm. this is cool. Because, you know, we get to do a lot of really sophisticated systems yeah. and this is a simple one by by those comparisons but still is very enjoyable very happy system yeah. because it just sounds good mm -hmm, you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm. and there's no frill but it's like full of frill yeah yeah i'm gonna hear one more song Dude, if he had a subwoofer in this, this would be silly. Yeah. This would be yeah. silly. And this would be like a total budget build, awesome sounding stereo. Huh. Add your subwoofer soon, that's all oh, I have yeah. to say. Oh yeah. Just add the subwoofer soon. <laughs> all right guys, enough of us taking up your time and talking about fun stuff. We're gonna continue to talk after the show is over, but Fernando, if you please, end the show. All right guys, on to the next one. Bye. <laughs>